<laughs> Welcome everyone. My name is Carolyn Collins and I'm the elementary science and engineering department head um, for the Wellesley Public Schools. I've been a teacher here in this district for um, many, many years, over 20 years. I started off as a fifth grade teacher, then became a fourth grade teacher for a while, and then six years ago took on this position as the science department head. Um, and I'm having the fall, I'm having the time of my life doing it. I really want to start off by just saying a warm welcome and a thank you. This trip would not be possible without your help. What we're going to be doing today is going around to visit five different sites around the town of Wellesley, all of geologic interest. You'll see when we get to these sites, they're small areas. And so it really would not be tenable to try to bring a school bus, you know, a full of either two or three fourth grade classrooms to these small sites and have it be in any way a meaningful experience for children. So that's why we rely on parent drivers to help us get these kids around. Each of you will take a group of kids and you'll kind of daisy chain around the sites. And that way we can limit the number of kids who are at the site at one time. I recognize that by coming, this is a huge time commitment for you both to do this training and then to actually do the trip itself. And so first and foremost, and I'll probably repeat it multiple times over the course of the day, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> we could not do this trip without your help. Um, over the last few years, we've actually been revamping and revising our science curriculum. Did any of you lead a ge the geology trip in the past? Good, you don't have to unlearn anything. <laughs> because the nature of the trip has changed over the last few years. Our fourth grade geology study now, students really focus on changes to the Earth's surface, those things that can change the landscape. And in those, there's gonna be slow changes and there's fast changes. Fast changes would be things like earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides, those kinds of things. The slow changes are those things that take thousands if not millions of years to happen. And that really is the focus of what we're gonna be talking about today. The nice thing about this geology trip is this, you'll notice along the way I keep calling it a geology field investigation. This is an opportunity, it's more or less a culminating experience for the students when they get to take all of the information they've learned in the classroom and apply it to a real world setting. So they are out here today to be geologists, to look for evidence of the slow and fast changes that have happened to the surface of the earth. So today we will be previewing the route so I can show you the different sites. I'll give you some extra background information. But the most important thing to understand is that for this trip, the kids are the ones who are doing the heavy lifting. They're the ones doing the work. It's on them to try to figure out, look at the sites and see what's going on. I've given you two handouts. The short little small one. On one side you'll see it's a navigation of where you can find more information. There's a lot of information available on the website um, and you'll see from that that it just kind of maps you through how to get there. And it really has a lot more rich information in it. So those, site, those are available to you. On the back side of that piece of paper are the same GPS locations I gave you in the email yesterday. So that if you want to enter them into a navigation device. Keeping in mind, of course, that we're going to see rock formations that don't have a street address. So I've got, given you a GPS address that gets you close, so you can pretty well figure out where to go. The other packet, I hope, is everything that you're going to need to know to run this trip. Um, in the front, there's just some general information about the geology unit. And then as you go in, you'll see we have site sheets for each individual site. So with that, I think we're going to go ahead and get ourselves started and start visiting our first site. As we go through the trip, I will give you, I'm not going to front load with a whole lot of geologic information to begin with. I'll just kind of be giving it to you as we go so that it kind of makes sense as we see these things in context. I'll also be giving you some hints and just tricks about leading the trip itself. Sound good? Great. All right, let's go. So you'll notice in your packet, if you turn to the Longfellow Pond list, you'll see there's parts of the text that are in bold. And right now in bold, you'll see, this is basically your script. This is all you really need to say along your way. So you'll notice it says, as you walk up the hill, look at the path. What do you notice about the material in the path? Look at the rocks and stones. What do you notice? 
So I invite you all, as we're heading uphill now, just take a look at the environment around you, take a look at the path, see what you see and what, look for what you're seeing and think about what you're not seeing. Right now, we're at the top of something called an esker. And so before we do anything else, I invite you to look down either side and tell me what do you notice. And here's the thing about a question like, what do you notice? There isn't a wrong answer because you see what you see. <laughs> so what do you notice? What about the landscape? You're on the top of a really high, thin ridge. About two million years ago, and so here's when we start getting into geologic time. Hello. Um, so quick note about running a field, a field investigation. Things happen, surprises happen, and one of the things you need to talk to kids about is managing the unexpected. So when you have a dog that wanders through and you've got a group of kids, you can easily have a couple kids who are like, oh, look at the cute dog, and now are completely distracted. Or you can have a couple kids going, ah, I'm afraid of dogs, and are completely distracted. So one of the things I'm just going to encourage as we go through this trip to remind you is to welcome. Hi. Um, remind you is help kids manage the unexpected. So back to our geology. Around Two, I mean, our climate has always had warming periods and cooling periods. And about two million years ago, the climate started cooling. Um, ice sheets in northern Canada started building up. Basically, it would, the snow would fall in the wintertime, and then the summers were never quite warm enough for that all to melt. So the following winter, more snow landed on top of the snow that was already there. And this happened over the period of you know thousands of years. Eventually, those ice sheets got so thick that the weight of the ice started pushing down and caused the ice underneath to start pushing out and go forward. That's what we call glacial advance. And that's when the ice ages, you hear about these ice ages creeping south, that's what it was. It was the pressure of all this ice pushing down and forcing things outward. Um, the peak of the ice age here in New England was about 22 to 25,000 years ago. So now here's a quick note, the scope of geologic time. Some of the rocks that we're gonna be looking at today formed over 600 million years ago. 22,000 years in the scope of geology is a really short time period. But still for us, that was a long time ago. So the peak of the ice age here in New England was about 22 to 25,000 years ago. As these ice sheets advanced south, any kind of loose material got frozen up in that ice and would often be carried along. So things either got pushed aside or moved by the ice or just frozen up into the ice and carried. So rock and rock debris got carried for, could be carried for thousands and thousands of miles. Now one thing that could, oh, geologists estimate that the glaciers could be up to a mile high. So now I just want you to imagine you have a mile high of ice above you. Now here in New England, we don't know if they were a mile high, but at a minimum they were several thousand feet high, which is still an awful lot of ice. So you've got to imagine the impact that's going to have. Clearly there's not going to be anything living in this area when the ice melts because all the trees and everything have been under all this ice. Also, all the loose rock, debris, soil, whatever else, will have been frozen up into that glacier and just made a glacial mess. And then eventually that ice melts and all that stuff gets left behind. So as the glacier, yes. Do we need to remember those numbers and facts? You do not. I'm giving you background information just so that you have it. Um, again, if you follow the script, you've got yeah, what you need say to know. The boat. Yep. So, and there is actually in this packet in various places, there's lots of different background information for you. I'm glad you asked that question. 
because in the back of the packet, you'll see geology background information, and it talks a little bit about how rocks are made. It also talks about glaciers in New England. And it's really important to think about the glaciers in New England because it had a major impact on the landscapes and the, what we see here in New England. Um, imagine the, you know, the weight of all that ice and what it's doing to this, to this area. Now, one thing that could happen in a glacier is that you know, as it's moving around, a crack could form in the ice. And there could be warming and cooling periods. And so say it's one of those slightly warming periods, still not enough to melt those thousand, you know, thousand feet of ice. But a crack forms and melting water starts dripping down. And it's going to start dripping down until it hits bedrock or it hits the surface. And then you might actually get a little stream that starts running under the ice. And on some of our really heavy <coughs> winters, you may have noticed sometimes where you see these snow, you might see little melt streams coming out from underneath the ice. Let me ask you, what did you notice as you walked up the path about the, ro uh, the, the, the rocks in the path? A lot. A lot? A lot. There's a lot. They're not they're pebbles. And they're pebbles. They're, they're small. Did you, is that what you said? I said they're small. Yeah. They're small, yeah. Yep, a lot of rock, a lot of really small pebble debris. It's a little hard to see with all the leaves here, but lots of really small rocks. So we've got our, our melting water coming down and a little stream starts running under the ice. And so certainly any small rocks or whatever else that was in that ice kind of settle out and form a bit of a stream bed. And then maybe some years it's colder, some years it's warmer. It, you know, the little stream freezes, then it thaws again, it starts running again. Only now it's running on top of all those little pebbles and everything else that had melted into the ice, that had fallen out of the ice. Then we get warming and cooling, it freezes up again, and then it thaws and the stream starts running, but now it's running on here. All this time though, it's caught between, it's stuck between walls of ice. Again, remember, we've got thousands of feet of ice above us and we have this little stream running underneath. You know, that little stream maybe kind of melts out a little tunnel and all the debris and the rock stuff that's in that little, in the ice falls, it settles out and our stream starts, you know, it settles out on that and then the stream starts running on that. And then this keeps happening over hundreds of years or over time and eventually you end up with this pile of debris underneath all these walls of ice. But eventually that ice is going to melt away and all you're going to be left with is this tall thin ridge. If you look in your packet you'll see in the back there's a page about eskers. And you'll see here again this graphic. So a little crack forms in the ice, melting water drips down. A little stream starts to run. Eventually layers and layers and layers of gravel start building up underneath those walls of ice. Eventually the ice melts away and you end up with this high thin ridge like we're on right now. So this is indeed an esker. And there's eskers all over the north of this area. There's a long esker that runs on the north shore only and it used to run all the way down to the Atlantic Ocean in Beverly. It's not continuous anymore because most of it, a lot of it was used to build I-95 North. Perfect source of gravel. Nature's gravel that they just dug up the esker and used that gravel. That makes sense? So it's a little counterintuitive because right now we are standing on the bottom of a stream bed. And yet you look on either side of us and you see how high up we are. And it can, it's really kind of confusing. But definitely, we would not be on this if it weren't for the glaciers here in New England. Now, quick note about the trip, because I was asked a couple questions on the way up. Um, you'll see I gave you the list of GPS locations. There are five sites. Each group, and the classroom teacher will probably divide the class into five separate groups. Each group will start at a different site. So the order we're doing things now, there's nothing magical about starting at Longfellow Pond. I start here because we've got a parking lot where we can all meet. But on the day of the trip, one group may start at Longfellow Pond, the next may start at St. Mary's, the next may start at Hemlock Gorge, and you'll just daisy chain your way around it. This trip is being used more or less as a formative assessment for students. So you'll notice in your packet 
there will be a series of questions that we just kind of ask you to ask at every single site. And those are, what evidence is there of weathering, erosion, and deposition? And are any evidence of changes happening now? So the students will have some kind of notes that they'll be taking. I leave it, you know, people will often ask me, well, will they be doing this or will they be doing that? And the answer is yes, <laughs> because it really depends on the teacher. So take the teacher's lead, she'll tell you how she wants things organized and what the, what the expectation for the children is on the trip. So when you ask the question, will the student write down the answer on their notebook or will they say it back? I think say back. It's really, my goal here is to get students talking. And a really important thing is I will give you some answers. I do not expect you necessarily to give the answers to the children. This is about them and their thinking. This will make more sense as we keep going. Because I don't, you know, I'm going to keep giving you a bit more information as we go. So keep on to your, hold on to your questions. And I hope everything will become clear as we keep going. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions about this ESCR and how this formed? Excellent. All right.